I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP. Thank you for your continued support and input into our work. Both of these are crucial to our success. And I'm thrilled to welcome today's presenter, Cameron Riopel. He is Head of Data Services at the University of Miami Libraries, which has developed a significant suite of research data management services. We invited Cameron to provide not only an overview of their services, but also insights into how he and his colleagues address some of the challenges, like how to support researchers working within different disciplines, platforms, research methods, and how to manage keeping skills and knowledge up to date when research and the RDM landscape are dynamic and constantly evolving. And so um, with that, Cameron, I'm turning things over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm Cameron Riopel. Thank you very much for being here today. So let's just get started then. I'm going to move to the next slide. All right, so my presentation has two goals. First, I'm going to talk about ways in which I try to keep up to date with research, how to keep on training, how to make sure that our suite of services that have to do with research data management is relevant and people are aware of it. After that, or throughout actually, I'll be talking about our own situation here at the University of Miami, what we are doing in particular. And I wanted to highlight before I start that this is not the best objective way to do RDM services at a university. This is very subjective. This is based upon our own experiences our own budget and staff, and there's no one true way to do this. So this is not my effort to tell you how to do it best. This is just my own perspective and my observations along the way. One thing I wanted to also highlight is that every institution is very different and it's composed differently. Therefore, what we see as data here might be very different from another place. And on that note, the University of Miami is also its own particular place. It's a medium-sized university, it's private, and some of the programs that it's very strong in are relatively unique. For instance, we have a very, very strong marine and atmospheric science program. We're right across the street from NOAA. And we also have a medical campus with a robust research program where residents are attached to hospitals all over South Florida. All right. This is the Richter Library, which is the library that's at the undergraduate or main campus of the University of Miami. The sun is not always setting here or rising. It does occasionally rain and be cloudy, but I wanted to show you a picture of our library. So before we go into the meat of it, one thing I wanted to talk about is the goal of data services. In my opinion, data services triangulates between data curation, data management, software instruction, and also research methods. This area of working within the realm of research methods is of particular interest to me personally. For one thing I wanted to share is that my background is that I have a master's in statistics and my PhD is in sociology, so I came into data services from a slightly different background. I have a lot of experience with methodology, and it is personally interesting to me. However, I wanted to make a case to you that it also is very useful in providing value to a research environment on campus when we can instruct and provide support, not only in the programs that are used for research and the products of research, but the methods themselves. And this argument, in my opinion, would go as follows, that in order to do software instruction, we already have to be somewhat aware or at an intermediate level of the research methods that are used in that software program. So if I teach someone SPSS, I have to know how to make tables and do test, tests and models that um, are actually part of the stats process. If I teach someone a qualitative research software program like in vivo, I also have to be aware about how to do coding 
and reconcil reconciliation of codes and make sure that best practices are followed. So it's, in my opinion, natural that we support both the methods and the software. And if we keep on, keep on having that in mind, we can try to figure out how do we work to a goal where we support not just the data products of research, not just software instruction, but the actual research process in its whole. It's not a possible goal to ever fully achieve, but it's something that we can always work toward, that we have to be aware that there's never a moment where we achieve a goal here. It's just a constant thing we're striving for. So here at the University of Miami, I tried to share with you our research data management bundle. Now, I'm trying to follow the OCLC's idea of scoping the research data management bundle, which if you don't know of this, please check it out. There are many resources. I'm hoping that one of our OCLC um, people who are here can share it over the chat. But our bundle, following their division of the aspects of data services or RDM into curation, education, and expertise, our bundle goes as follows. First, for curation. We do review data management plans. We get a fairly small number of these a year. We're hoping to increase this number as we market these services more fully. Similarly, we do assign DOIs to data sets for data deposits. We do eight to 10 a year, and once again, we hope to expand this in the future. We assist with the data deposit process, whether or not it's our own institutional repository, or it's into another repository somewhere that's more specialized, can take larger data sets, or is the one that the journal might be asking for the deposit. So currently we are using a product called Esploro as our RIS. It is hosted by Ex Libris and it's in progress right now. And although I'm not personally involved in the process of transitioning to Esploro, we used to use Depress and we do not now. For the education component, what we're doing right now is we do workshop series. These workshop series are software instructional in nature, usually. I teach workshops on R, SPSS, SAS, Tableau, REDCap, and any number of workshops. And I do it based upon my own awareness of what is needed from previous experience, as well as on a request basis. So people can request that I teach a workshop, and I will. Hopefully it's a program I know already. If not, I have to learn it. And that is something that I'll be talking about in more detail soon. We also do workshops on data management and we do workshops on visualization. Our GIS workshops are not just about the software programs, but often about the methods themselves. We do many GIS course supports. So in terms of areas of expertise, we do one-on-one -on -one consultations. I host open office hours on different libraries on the campus. I'll be showing you where these libraries are. Our GIS librarian also does this. We have a digital scholars lab, which is a specialized computing lab with the research software needed for particular specialized research. We also have a learning commons, which hosts a variety of services, primarily for undergraduate audience, but also for graduate students, and we're building for faculty support. At this Learning Commons, we have a writing center, a math lab, we have tutoring, languages, many things. And in this center is where we have our Digital Scholars Lab. So a bit of the history of what we're doing. My position has existed for about more than two years. I started as a data services librarian. Now I'm the head of data services. The GIS librarian has been here for over four years, and he has over 18 years of experience. We've newly merged services so that in the umbrella of data services, there is both data services and GIS services. Our staffing is as follows. There's myself, the head of data services. There's a GIS librarian, a GIS and data specialist. He spends 20 hours a week in the specialized computing lab, and he also goes to other campuses to support we are opening a search for a biomedical data librarian, hopefully in the next month or so. And this librarian position would be attached to the medical campus library. And the person would have now specializations in the realm of medical research and medical data. 
We also have a research data scientist who is jointly appointed with the Center for Computational Studies on campus. And this appointment is also very important to us because it helps us bridge between the world of big data, supercomputing, and the world of servers and all this really complicated stuff that, well, I don't know at all, and, but he is very aware of it. And since he's uh, partly there and partly at the library, he can bridge these gaps for us. He also handles the on-point assignment of DOIs and deposits. Trying to click the next slide, give me a second, thank you. So here's our spaces of operation. I'm aware the map is fairly small, but there are three libraries in the Miami area in which we operate. On the bottom left of the map is Coral Gables, Florida, where the Richter Library, the main library, the one that I showed you the picture of, that's where that is located, and that's where I am some of the week. In the north, there's the medical library, which is attached to two different hospital systems. We go there once a week for office hours. And we also have an, a library called the Marine Science Library, RASMAS, R-S-M-A-S Library. And this is in Virginia Key. And it's across the street from NOAA, and we get a lot of marine and atmospheric research there. We go there once a week as well. The photo to the right of the map is our little digital scholars lab, which is the specialized computing lab. There are 12 computers in it, each with two screens. This is something that we are hoping to increase in the future as we renovate. I'll go into a little more detail very shortly. And then the photo on the bottom is our learning commons, which has all the hosted spaces for writing centers, math tutoring, etc. So this is my state of the data services slide. I want to highlight some things that, in my opinion, we are doing well here. We are teaching many stats and GIS and work workshops on a variety of topics. I think that if we added together our workshops and course supports throughout a semester, we probably would have 70 or 80. And this is including going to courses and teaching. I personally am doing about 400, 500 data services consultations a year, and these tend to be methods and software instruction heavy. And our GIS librarian is doing over 800 consultations a year, many of those involving the administration of GIS licenses for ArcGIS programs like ArcMap, ArcGIS Online, and Business Analyst Online. There are some things we are working on. One thing that we're working on is improving our Digital Scholars Lab. That was the photo I just showed you of the 12 computers. We are finding that 12 computers, while it's better than not having them, it's not quite large enough to be able to work well as a space for workshops. That when we advertise our workshops, they tend to fill up within a day of advertising them. However, when there are only our 12 spots, it can pose some problems in terms of the way that need is addressed on campus. That we get large wait lists and not everyone who shows up to work, not everyone who registers for a workshop shows up to it. So when you have 100 spaces in a room, it's okay if 70% show up. But when you only have 12, it's a lot more alarming and it means that you might have to teach the same workshop multiple times in order to address need. We are currently undergoing renovation in our library and we will soon be doubling the space of this lab so that we have 24 computers and not 12. Hopefully this works toward addressing that problem. Another thing we're doing is trying to increase our staffing. We are finding that our numbers are quite high here and we're starting to hit limits in terms of how we can support people in terms of raw numbers. So hopefully hiring a biomedical data librarian will help address that problem. One thing we are working on as well is something, a data collections plan so that we have an actual strategy for obtaining data which is useful to researchers and students. This is something that's on our to-do list for the fall. And finally, we have some things we are not doing right now, but probably should be doing. There are many more things than the two that I've highlighted here, of course, but one major one is that we are currently not teaching workshops on qualitative 
research software for data analysis. This is not for anything but budget-related reasons. At the moment, we have three licenses for the program in vivo, and with three licenses, it's not enough to advertise a workshop. As part of the renovation budget allocation, we are hoping that we can get 24 licenses and start teaching programs. And finally, one gap that I've found is that in our current staffing structure and areas of expertise, we have three geographers and then myself, who is by training a sociologist and statistician. What we do not have is someone who's an expert in the types of visualizations that are narrative or storytelling in nature. And by that, I mean infographics, ways in which you can tell some sort of amazing visualization that tells a story from start to finish, across time maybe, journalistic representations of um, some important narrative that the public is supposed to react to and care about. And this is a burgeoning field in the world of data, and we are currently not staffed with the expertise to really help with it. And hopefully we can soon bring in a graduate student or fellow or something to address this. Um, one thing that I wanted to share is that I think that having someone who's an expert in these qualitative storytelling visualizations probably will make data services more appealing to the general campus audience. People who are qualitative researchers or don't even think of themselves as using data might find themselves coming to a person like this very often. But I'm not entirely sure because we haven't yet tried to address that gap. All right. So I'm half jokingly calling this slide a philosophy of data services. But it's more of just some of my thoughts about how data services operates. In my opinion, and of course this is very subjective, data services operates at the intersection of data curation, research methods, and I will include software instruction in that, and also disciplinary knowledge. Data curation is very important, and in some ways it's a traditional approach to data services, and it's something that always matters. As long as there's research, there are products of the research process, and we should find a way to help people deal with those products in a way that ensures replicability, and that the journals that are peer-reviewed are often requiring people to have DOIs. This is all very important. I think we're all aware of that. For the research methods, it's my argument that bringing in applied method support is a way to make data services continuously relevant. And this is something that is quite difficult to do, of course, because we are not experts on one particular discipline. The third component of the data services operation is disciplinary knowledge. And this is the knowledge that a researcher or a student or a faculty member brings to the table when they meet with you. And I don't think this is our job to know the disciplinary knowledge. We don't have to be the expert at the subject of the person we're meeting with. This is what, this is the gap of what is missing that the person we're meeting with brings to the table. It's important to be aware that discipline knowledge is critical to helping and that we are not necessarily the people who will know it because every field has different methods and approaches to data. So if we have just one solution or we think this is the solution that works for all fields, we may lead them astray. So there are some approaches to operating as a data services program. First of all, I think it's important that we consider the pros and cons of being free or being cost recovery or having a fee structure. If you have a fee structure or your cost recovery and it's working well, you have the options of improving your technology, upgrading your software programs without issue, and maybe hiring more staff. However, there are other things which are cons to being a fee structure. One is that people who have to be able to pay in order to use your services, and this can be very difficult for graduate students, students, junior faculty without grants, any number of problems that arise in a momentary way that require quick resolution. 
And also, it's my opinion that if we are free, it's one way of trying to create equity on a campus environment, that if we can help everybody, it'll sort of level the playing field a little bit. And I'm very aware that each university being different, the, the amount of equity you can help create will vary. For instance, at the University of Miami being a private institution, we rarely see members of the public and people have to be able to afford to attend the University of Miami to achieve help in their problems. Another thing to know is that I've observed that being free helps word of mouth. When you help someone for free, they're going to tell their colleagues, their friends, the other students that there's a free person who's capable of helping. And it's always worth a try, right? Because you're not paying for it. So even if they don't help you, you're going to try to help, get help. So being welcoming, I think, is particularly important. And this is something that's always a work in progress for everyone, given different cultural contexts, given different personalities. Being welcoming to one person might be very different to another person. So I have no universal way to be welcoming. I can only share with you the ways in which I try to approach being welcoming. But the way I approach it is from my own positionality as a white man with a PhD, it might be something in which I can underassert my authority and still be seen as an authority for all I know. So I think it's very important to be very aware that our positionality probably affects the ways in which we can be welcoming or be seen as an expert. So what I try to do then is I try to tell people that I'll meet them halfway, that I have this generalist knowledge, but they're the expert in their subject. But I see a lot of data sets. I see a lot of methods. So together we can try to help solve the problem. I tell people that imagine that we are both one half of a Venn diagram. And then when we intersect, we were able to work toward a solution. Some things which I've observed along the way is that I try to be aware of the idea of microaggressions that behavior can be un unwelcoming to people, especially if it's um, based upon different things like gender or, or race. If I make it, people feel unwelcome, that's something I do not want to happen. I also want to be aware that part of what we do is emotional communication work, where a graduate student might come to you because they have trouble communicating to their advisor about the fact that findings weren't significant or that maybe the method that their advisor says to use is not really right or it can't be done in a program and they're very upset and you have to try to help them somehow. These are problems which are thorny in nature and problems which there may not be a right solution for and yet we find ourselves in these situations. Finally, we want to be useful that when people come to us for help, we probably should want to see them a second time. We're not usually a one-time service even if we solve the problem, because as they go through the arc of the research process, there are multiple points at which we can help them, such as during the learning the software step or during the data deposit step. But also, problems will arise throughout the research process, problems which they don't expect. And when they don't expect it, they're sort of panicked and they want to know, what do I do? And then they come to us. And finally, we want to be comprehensive, we want to be relevant, we want to be someone who's aware of what is happening so that we can make sure when we make recommendations, these recommendations are reflective of what is happening in research and ideally at the cutting edge of research. So about this idea of trying to keep relevant, trying to keep comprehensive and be on the cutting edge of research, it's a lot easier said than done, right? There's so much out there that is research. How do we even approach this? And it's something that I struggle with all the time. So I have two different metaphors because, well, why not, right? Met metaphors are fun. The first metaphor has to do with the idea of the realm of academic research. I like to imagine that it's a universe and the universe is constantly expanding and the edges are constantly moving further and further away and also getting larger and there's more and more happening. The boundaries are expanding. And that means that we can never just stay static. What it also means, though, is that researchers are never going to hit a point where they feel comfortable with what they're doing and they know everything. There's always more to know. Similarly, 
we are going to be most helpful at the edge of the boundaries of research where there is the most uncertainty is because we operate in the field of helping people with uncertainty. They come to us for help when they do not understand something. Which brings us to the idea of surfing. Now, I've actually never surfed before, so this may sound, this is me trying to talk about surfing without having surfed. But in my idea of surfing, there's this giant wave, and that's the wave of knowing everything. And we're never going to be on top of the wave because we're never going to know everything. We don't want to be floundering around in the water because that's not surfing. Instead, we want to be somewhere in the middle, finding a balance, being comfortable with the fact that we don't know everything, and being comfortable with the fact that we are not an expert in the subject. We're never going to know everything, and we have to be aware of this fact. I have found personally with training people in the realm of consulting and helping with data that sometimes people who are very talented at research have trouble with consulting because they want to be somebody who knows the answer. And the fact they may not know the answer is alarming to them and it affects their confidence. So instead, we have to be aware of the fact that we may not know the answer, and we still have to meet with people and try to work with them to find a solution. So how do we know when there is a need for something new and know that we have to start training on it or teaching a new workshop on it or doing advertisements that say we now support a service. In my opinion, I divided these into direct requests and indirect requests. The area of direct requests, I think we've all seen examples of this probably at different work environments where, like for instance, I've been told, I would love for you to come to my lab and teach us how to use Envivo. So I have to go there and do that. I know that there's a need because I was asked to do it. Similarly, I have examples where I've been asked to learn and teach Tableau in the last several years, and also learn and teach REDCap. Tableau is for data visualization, and Vivo is for qualitative data analysis. And REDCap is a program for survey questionnaire design that is HIPAA compliant, often used in medical research. I did not know REDCap, and I didn't even know that REDCap was a thing until I was asked to teach it. So I had to spend some time training, learning it, building instructional materials on it. But I was aware the need existed because I went to the medical campus, did my open office hours, and in interacting with different residents and doctors, they asked me to do this. So I began supporting it. I never claimed to be an expert on REDCap, and I still wouldn't claim that. But I definitely am able to teach it at an intermediate or getting started level. There also are indirect requests, and these are really any number of things. It's often when somebody comes to you with a topic-based question, but you are aware that there is an existing solution for it. The person coming to you with the question may not be aware of that, so you help them point them toward a solution. Other times, if someone comes to you with a problem, and you are not aware of the solution, but you are aware there must be a solution somewhere, so you have to do a lot of research to figure out where to even get started. Maybe you talk to your peers, other librarians, you talk to faculty that you have a relationship with. And some examples of things that are in indirect requests that we get regularly are people needing help with data management, learning a certain program, or replicating a study. They may not know why they need it or exactly how to do it, so you help them get started. So the situation then is that somebody came to you and said, I would like you to teach or consult on a certain software program, or maybe a certain method or a topic, and you don't know it. This happens all the time. You're never going to know everything. There's a lot that we don't know. So this brings us to training. My big takeaway, I guess, from this presentation to you is that I think it's very important that training is made visible and part of the workflow, and that everyone is aware that is a critical part of the process of building an effective research data management service. One thing is that we have to make room for training. The day and the workday become very busy 
and that we have to schedule training. During the summer, I schedule a research day for myself and I offer it to my staff members as well. If somebody wants to, they can work from home during that day as long as they have the program with them and they can spend the day studying. The studying can take any number of forms. The studying can be learning a new software program, learning a new method, being part of a project that they're working on maybe with other researchers. It could be reviewing the literature on a subject that we're doing a lot of support in. So we do a lot of marine science research support, but I'm not a marine science researcher, so I may want to read up on the common programs and methods used in marine science research. And it's a good opportunity to play around, make room for play, experiment with data in ways in which there are no stakes or low stakes. Often it's good to take on new projects as long as you're aware of the deadline being relatively short until completion and that it's possible to do. And so one thing that I think is really important is that we can also use the methodology sections of peer-reviewed articles to understand better the ways in which people are operating in research environments. That if I want to suddenly be very aware of how marine science research works, I can turn to marine science articles and read their methods sections. They'll often tell me which programs, which packages, which methods are being used and why. And finally, it's important to try to be our own best practices. We often teach people how to do data management the proper way. We teach people how to make sure that when you're doing research that there are scripts and records of what you do, that data are backed up. But when it comes to everyday work, at least I've found, I'm not always, um, I guess I'm guilty sometimes of relaxing these best practices for the sake of efficiency or when I don't think something matters as much. But I try very hard though to follow the things that I teach. Whenever I save a file, I date it and I name it. One thing that I do often is I have a variety of data sets which I'm calling fake data, but maybe they're data that's similar to the structure of data sets that people have been working with with me. And I use this fake data to learn new methods, learn new programs, and in situations where I have to help somebody, but I can't see the real data. This happens regularly with human subjects research when you're not on the IRB. So I wanted to highlight to you that there are many ways in which a consultative process can happen. I've divided it into four possible scenarios. And this is assuming that we start with a meeting where you evaluate the question of the person you're meeting with and you listen to their request. It might happen over email as well, but in person is often more effective at understanding what is happening. I, I personally found that people writing emails are not always using the words that they're not sure what they're saying sometimes. They're trying to express complex ideas quickly. So when you meet with them in person, it's a lot easier to, to get a better idea of what they need. So let's say you start with meeting with somebody and you evaluate and listen to their request. It's ideal, I suppose, if you can immediately jump to a solution or resolution. This does not always happen. Instead, we sometimes meet with people, listen, and then we tell them, this is really interesting. I have to go back and read some more, study some more. And then you arrange a second meeting. And then you work on it with them in the second meeting. And either you resolve it then, or you keep on having iterative meetings until some resolution is met. This happens quite frequently. A third one is that you meet, you listen to the person, and you decide that maybe you aren't the person they need help from. Maybe you know a faculty member who is doing research so similar that you can say, go meet with this person and you can help set up a connection, CC them on an email introducing them. And finally, it's possible that you hear their request and you decide that is outside the scope of your program. And this also happens frequently. And this is something where you decline to help them. It's possible you can refer them to a paid service, but times in which I have declined to help people are when people ask me to do their homework for them. I don't do that when people ask me to do the project management work from start to finish as a lab manager, I don't do that. And I also do paid work where 
I am the report writer for a process. I declined that as well. Some thoughts about these four possible scenarios. The first is that the more you engage in number two of the cycle of preparing, studying, and meeting with people, the more you're going to have increased knowledge and work toward future immediate resolutions. It's rare that we see a problem from one person that won't be asked again later that year from someone else. That when you refer people to another faculty member, it's building bridges, it's networking. People will eventually refer them back to you, and that's great. And finally, even when you help resolve an issue or problem or question, people probably will have more questions as they work. So I have two examples of a workflow in which I was asked questions, and I wanted to share both of them with you. The first is from a marine science graduate student. And once again, I am not a marine scientist, and I will never be a marine scientist, and that's okay. Here's the snippet from the email they sent me, word for word. They said they're studying the movements of large coastal sharks. They're doing passive acoustic biotelemetry. And they want help quantifying the residency, site fidelity, and activity spaces, parentheses, minimum convex polygons, of these animals using R. In that entire paragraph at the time, the only thing I actually knew, other than where Florida was, was how to use R. I, I am a person who uses R. So only one area of that paragraph meant anything to me, really. I, I have never seen the words residency, site fidelity, or activity spaces. I have just enough awareness of the world of GIS that when I saw minimum convex polygons, I thought to myself, that sounds like a GIS part. So my first action was I actually referred the student to our GIS library who helped them calculate these activity spaces using ArcGIS. When that was done, we got back to the meat of the problem, and we had to figure out how to help this person get started learning how to do some sort of R based analysis of residency site fidelity. This leads us to two different paths which diverge. You can either start with the program R and try to figure out how to do residency analysis in R. And our residency ends up being where a shark is at any given moment, by the way, or where an animal is. Or you can start with literature. And the two scenarios look as follows. The left area is the starting with R solution, and the right area is the literature-based solution. If I Google residency analysis R, it brings me to a package in R called ADE Habitat and a guide on how to do it. It works really well, the method is clear, and that's one possible solution. I could refer to the student this package. I could tell them, try learning this package. It does residency. But another approach, which is starting with the literature, I looked at the methods sections of articles about the movement and residency of sharks to see what the actual researchers on the subject are doing, right? This is a graduate student who wants to be able to publish in their field. So we have to be aware of the methods of what they are doing. So what I do is I tell the, the student, well, yes, here's the package in R, but also in your field, it appears they are doing a random walk, switching SSM. Now, I don't know what that is. I still don't know what that is, to be perfectly honest. I know what random walk is a little bit, but it's something beyond my scope. But I wanted to tell the student that you can use this package However, it does not look to be what the peer-reviewed peer researchers are doing. And the person take, took this information back to their advisor, said here's two different paths, and they communicate with their advisor, and they work to their solution there. That's not my business. It was my business to show them the paths. In my ideal world, both of these possible ways of looking for the solution using the program or using the literature should converge and find the same solution. However, this does not always happen. All right, my, my uh, second example is a lot briefer, and it's one in which I got this one a couple weeks ago. 
where somebody sent me an email asking, they're a nursing faculty member, they sent me an email asking for help designing and conducting a propensity score analysis study with children data. I didn't know what that was once again. And the questions I immediately thought to myself are what program, that's a stats program, do they know? What programs do they have? And how can we help? Is this a question in which data services can help? It turns out, after meeting with the person, that they didn't really want my help with all of that. They instead just wanted to know whether or not the program's data could do propensity score analysis. It could. And I walked them through a tutorial on how to do it, which I drew from a brief Google search. I used data from the tutorial. And I would never have been allowed to see the data anyway because it was human subjects research data. But they went away happy because they found a tutorial and they had some data to practice on. All right. So broadly speaking, when working with researchers, I try to take an attitude of meeting with them halfway, that together we'll solve the problem. I don't overpromise. I don't say to them, we're going to solve the problem now. I listen. I evaluate. I frame the first meeting as evaluative in nature. And if we can come to a solution, that's great. But they're not expecting that. I try not to solely take on the expert identity. There are areas in which I have expertise, but they're probably not the area of the person who's coming to me for help. So data services, in my opinion, and I, I'm biased as the data services person at our library, among others, is very valuable to the research environment. We bring value to our peers, our other librarians, and people who are engaged in data curation, because we help demystify data. We help liaison librarians see that Data is a product of the research environment. We help people get past the overwhelmed feeling when they see a spreadsheet and they don't know what to do with it. People know they can turn to us and we can help them. We help researchers as well, not only because we are aware of the research process, but being a free service brings value to the entire research enterprise because by being free and being central at a library, we bring new uses of the library environment. We are another reason to come to the library. And it's really exciting to be part of this sort of cutting edge territory. And people find that word of mouth will spread and people are aware there's all these different ways in which they can get help. So my closing thoughts then are that there's these two metaphors which I think are fun. And the first is that the world of research is constantly expanding and that we cannot always know everything and we never will. The idea of being uncertain of our expertise, we have to become comfortable with that because that area of uncertainty is where data services thrives. In areas of certainty, it's rarer for people to turn to us for help. That in order to stay afloat, so to speak, we have to surf in the middle of the areas of knowledge. We have to keep on being balanced. We're never going to know everything. And we're going to have to relate to the people that we help that together we'll solve the problem. And in order to keep afloat, so to speak, we have to keep on training. We have to make room for training. And this is a lot of communication work where part of what we do is communicate to people what we are doing and why it matters. That the administration, and I'm very lucky to have a very supportive administration, and I'm so excited to, to have that. But the administration should be aware that in order to do our job effectively, we have to spend a lot of time studying. And it's often invisible that there has to be room for play and experimentation. And make sure that there's room for training and labor that is invisible for your staff members as well. You have to have a certain amount of trust that somebody is actually training. You can establish checkpoints along the way to, to hear about their growth but let them work in their own environment comfortably, especially during the summer, a little bit a week. So that is my, my uh, slide deck. These are my observations, which are from my own subjective experience as data services librarian and now head of data services at the University of Miami Libraries. I'd be so excited to hear your thoughts and questions and anything that you want to share about your own experiences.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Cameron. Uh, that was a, an awfully uh, valuable, um, informative presentation. I, I really appreciated your perspective, um, how you walked us through through so much of that. Um, and, and really, I found those metaphors really useful to really help understand uh, that, that balance, that, that piece of really the, the surfing one where, where you know it's this big wave and you'll never get on top of it. But, um, you know, I, I think through the things that you pointed out, uh, the commitment to uh, training and development and, of course, being in a place where you've got support for that, um, I think that's, that's really valuable. So thanks for that. I am uh, opening up the floor to, uh, you know, there's, there's much here that Cameron uh, talked about, and if there's anything that you would like to comment on, uh, have some follow-up questions on, uh, now's your opportunity. Just type them into the chat. We have a, a few uh, few minutes to, to discuss here. I know that Brian Lavoy, uh, one of my colleagues um, here in our OCLC uh, research, had a question, and Brian, I was going to turn it over to you to ask Cameron. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, Cameron, uh, that was a great presentation, uh, really excellent. Um, so my question is, I mean, it strikes me that when you think about um, an RDM service bundle, that the, the, there has to be a balance somewhere between, uh, uh, on the one hand, you have services that are really general in nature, and in the sense that they uh, apply to all researchers. So, you know, basic data storage services, active data management, uh, help with data management plans, that sort of thing. So you have that on the one hand, but then on the other hand, you might have some services that are more specialized and are directed in supporting um, certain research cohorts on campus. So for example, uh, uh, data management services for disciplines that collect data from scientific instrumentation, uh, that sort of thing. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that scarce resources mean that, you know, you, you can't be everything to everybody. You can't do everything for everybody. But on the other hand, it also seems to me that engagement with researchers is, is, is much easier when you do have services that are customized um, in some way to support their specific uh, needs in, in, in terms of whatever their research workflows are. So um, I, I just wonder if you had some thoughts on how you strike that balance and what criteria you think about in striking that balance. Thank you very much, Brian. That is something that I think about a lot and I don't think I have the ideal solution for because as you said, we're always trying to find this balance between helping people but the limits of what we do are, are budget and time and expertise. So ways in which I try to um, work to do this balance, one thing I use is I use You Can Book Me to do my one-on-one -on -one consultation support where it's a free booking service that links to your Outlook calendar. And I block off time so that anybody can book an appointment with me at any time. And this is usually something the students use very often. And if I ever have a work meeting that gets in the way, it comes off the calendar so that people can't double book me. And that's a practical way of trying to find some sort of work balance. Another thing which we do is the open office hours. We go to the locations where the research is happening. So when we go to the medical campus and we do open office hours there, we often see medical research, right? And when we go to the marine science campus, we often see marine science research. However, we also have people who, in those moments of grad student desperation, they follow us around from campus to campus and try to use as much of our time as possible, where if we have open offices for four hours at three different sites throughout the week, then they might be there all the time at all three places and constantly asking questions. So it's something where we try to find a way to set these boundaries, but setting boundaries is often very difficult when somebody's doing a very long-term complex process. We encourage people to try to do their own work and try something first and then ask questions if something is not working. We also find that especially in the area of GIS services, that people are very quick to try to make sure our GIS experts do the work for them by saying they don't know how to do something. Um, 
and the GIS librarian and our GIS and data services um, staff member frequently has to try to remind people that they have to try it themselves first. And I think it's just an ongoing concern. And that also has to do with the boundaries that are time-based, where we, um, at the moment, are not doing much long-term project work in the sense of being like a back-end data management for project environments, because we just don't have the time to, to do that. Instead, we've been focusing on point-based problem solving, telling anybody when you encounter a certain problem, come to us and we'll try to help you through it. And you can do that multiple times, but we're not going to be the data management lab for a research project. But I think that there is a balance and there's always a better way of doing it. And this is why I'm so interested in hearing from everybody about what they are doing. Thanks, Cameron. We have a, another question that's come in through chat. What's the composition of the customers of your consultation services so far? Uh, for example, faculty, grad students, undergrad. Any breakdown in STEM versus liberal arts, humanities, social sciences? And then after that first initial consultation, how many of these grow into deeper collaborative projects? Thank you very much for this question. I actually, I love this question. Um, the composition of my consultation are primarily at the moment I'm helping graduate students and faculty. It's largely, the most students on our campus are undergraduates, but undergraduates here are the people I see least. I probably see, I would guess, an estimation about 70% graduate students, 25% faculty, and 5% undergrad. And I think it might be a product of the, the way that we have particular programs at the University of Miami that are very strong research programs, but then the general studies area is very, very um, undergraduate in nature and not really a research one environment in certain programs. So we see a variety of different types of research happening. But when there is research, it's often marine science or medical research. So in terms of the breakdown STEM versus liberal arts, humanities, and social sciences, I primarily see STEM and social scientific research. This might be a product of the fact that my own training is as a statistician and a, a PhD in sociology. So people come to me often seeing me as a free statistician. And that is a way in which I try to have market my services. It might be a unique product of my own background. Um, and then finally, in terms of oh, for humanities, we had a digital humanities librarian who recently left for another position at another university. And we, um, in the meantime, before we figure out the hiring process of a, I think we'll be hiring a new digital scholarship librarian in the future. Um, I've been helping with the consultations for digital humanities work as well. And I see many digital humanities graduate students. They're doing similar methods to everyone else, but often with different terms attached to them. At least that's my observation. And then the third question here, um, how many grow to deeper collaborative projects? This is very interesting to me because I often get people asking me to be a co-author on their projects. It's one, usually with medical researchers, especially when they have these um, publications with 12 doctors on them. It's something they can offer me that, in their opinion, is a material good for me. But also it means that I'll be attached to the project as a go-to person sort of on call. And I'm a little scared of doing that too often. So what I try to do is I try to pick and choose the collaborative projects that I'm on. And I evaluate them based upon a variety of criteria. One is, is this a faculty member who I want to build bridges with, right? Is this a network I want to build? If it is, I might say yes to the project. Second, do I think this person is going to try to push the edges of those boundaries and rely on me as a 24-hour on-call statistician. If so, I don't do the project. I also try to be very clear about the, these boundaries, and I tell them that, this, that any collaborative project work that I take on that goes outside the normal scope is going to be outside of my normal responsibilities, so don't expect that I can do a one-day turnaround, and I try to be very clear about those limits. I do take on projects. And I found some really interesting, it's a really interesting way to learn new things that I just recently had a couple of behavioral science publications where I'm a middle author on them because I've been helping enough behavioral scientists that um, it's been happening, I guess. Um, but it's kind of cool, a cool way to learn new skills and new terms and new methods. 
and I think that's all I can say about those questions for now. Thanks, Cameron. Are there any additional questions for Cameron? We have just a couple more minutes. You know, Cameron, one of the things that has struck me in listening to you talk about uh, the nature of your work and uh, some of the uh, skills that have really helped you um, is, is the interpersonal and uh, interpersonal communication skills, the social skills, that is clearly, uh, all the things that you said, being able to, to uh, really describe, you know, where your work ends and theirs begins and, and really collaborate. Um, and, and you've talked about how you've worked on developing your skills. Um, I'm just curious, are these interpersonal skills things that you've simply developed on the job? Is that uh, also a portion of the skills development that you're setting time aside for, um, not the, the technical piece so much as that um, uh, interpersonal and communication skill development? Thank you. I think that there are two different components of that that I can briefly address. One is that in terms of learning how to set boundaries and communicate value to people when you're doing training and things which are often relatively invisible, there needs to be extra effort in telling the people around you, hey, if you don't see me tomorrow, it's because I'm training all day or it's because I'm doing some research project and telling people that makes people expect that data services is more of a fluid realm than, it, than that of a librarian on a desk. Also, in terms of the development of interpersonal skills, I think there are probably are ways in which their library can support that development. I've had the good fortune of having administration which has paid for trainings in leadership and communication. And I'm not trying to argue that I am, I'm, I'm not perfect at these things, of course. It's something that I constantly have to work on. And also, many times, we only learn how to set the proper boundary after we fail on doing it the first time, right? Sometimes I have um, done something, agreed to do something, and later on regretted it and thought, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to agree to that type of thing again. <laughs> Great. Well, um, thanks, Cameron, for sharing that. We are um, just about at time. Um, I don't know, could you give a one-minute answer? Yes, to, I can. Uh, how you benchmark <laughs> uh, the success of the data services. All right, so first I want to mention that we do have an assessment librarian here who is trained in assessing library services. And what we have set up right now is that every time that I enter a consultation or workshop into my calendar, as long as I use the word consultation or workshop, it automatically gets sent to the assessment librarian through something called Microsoft Flow. I am not an expert in how to do this particularly, but you can email me and I can share the details after talking to our assessment librarian. But I'm aware that everything that I do, as long as I enter into my calendar, is tracked. However, I also think that there are ways in which the raw numbers don't actually um, convey the meaning making or value of what we do, right? There's a lot of things which you do which are immeasurable. And we have to, just like all librarians and all people in any workplace, put some extra work in to explain to people why the things that can't be measured so easily are also valuable. That if our numbers are a little lower or higher one year, it doesn't really mean we're doing better or worse. It means that we're doing different things probably. And that's all about having an encouraging and welcoming administration, I think. Thank you. Well, Cameron, that is a fantastic note to end on. Thank you so much, for um, Cameron, for your wonderful presentation. I know that we've, we've all learned a lot and you've given us a lot to think about today. Uh, to all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. We'll post a webinar online and we'll notify you by email available. Thanks again, and this concludes today's webinar.